Uh, welcome to our talk, uh, when every second counts, uh, what you need to know not to waste CPU cycles. Uh, I'm Erwin Kolsta and this is uh, Matthias. Yeah, my name is Matthias. And uh, our talk is going to be about optimization techniques. Yeah, and this is uh, what we're going to cover. We're going to cover something. Uh, look at some hard limits, how to identify bottlenecks, uh, some optimization techniques. Uh, we're going to go through some scenarios where people often make mistakes when it comes to optimization. Uh, talk a little bit about how to squeeze out that little last milliseconds out of your code. And uh, we're going to end up there. Yes, do you want to yeah. say something about. So. The first thing I think it's worth pointing out when we talk about optimizing for at least execution speed, but any kind of optimization in software at least, uh, a lot of people know this, anyone who works with computers knows this, but they kind of forget about it. And computers aren't magical, right? There are some hard limits that are imposed, uh, and we're ultimately kind of bound by the laws of physics, right? Computers aren't magic. Um, execution time itself is usually bound by four things. Uh, the processing speed of the CPU you have in your machine, uh, the memory capacity you have, and the speed of that memory, uh, disk, uh, disk input and output, and then finally network latency. There might be other factors playing in, but these are usually like the four kind of pitfalls um, for limiting the execution time uh, of any piece of software. Right? And basically, What's worth remembering is that data access is bound by the speed of light, right? We can't move electrons from your disk into your CPU faster than the speed of light, however much we'd like that. Uh, this is a super old picture. This is from a presentation in Microsoft in 1999 uh, by, the, uh, uh, by the famous researcher Jim Gray. He was trying to find kind of a visual, um, uh, kind of a visual expl explanation for why certain operations are super fast in software and why certain uh, at least like data heavy operations are super slow and so what you see on the left side is um, anything that kind of happens in the cpu register itself we give that kind of a time index of one the time it takes to fetch that data and process it in the cpu itself if we then move to the on-chip cache this is usually like the level two cache or the level one cache in your cpu it's like twice, it's going to take twice as much time fetching data from there and getting it into the CPU, right? The level 2 and level 3 cache are even even slower and so on when you get into main memory, try to get um, data from your disk. And again, this slide kind of shows it, its age uh, by the last example being an optical tape robot. But, you know, it's kind of the same thing today. What we have in the middle here is kind of, if you try to transpose this onto your real life, fetching a memory from your brain you can do that within a minute, right? If you need to fetch something here at the hotel, it might take you 10 minutes, you need to run over to your room. Um, the equivalent of moving back to main memory, people think of RAM as being super fast, right? Compared to trying to recollect from memory, that's the equivalent of going to the other side of town. This is gonna take hours, right? And ultimately, if you're going to have to move, again, electrons from your spinning disk somewhere all the way through your hardware into CPU you somewhere, this is the equivalent of sending um, uh, a mission to Pluto, right? The edge of our solar system. And finally, if you need something from an offline media, again, op an optical robot trying to read from a tape somewhere, this is the equivalent of trying to travel to the Andromeda ga uh, galaxy and back again to fetch some information. Um, Another kind of more recent, uh, famous uh, kind of overview of kind of the relationship uh, is again the level one cache in your CPU. You can fetch data from there in like less than a nanosecond. And again, as we kind of move through the layers of hardware, it gets exponentially slower, right? So even like reading 4K randomly from your super fast SSD is already 300,000 times as slow as trying to read something that's already in your CPU kit. The abstractions that we implement in software, and this applies to any kind of software, power shell include, right, also impose some overhead. Because at some layer, we need to translate what we express uh, as a PowerShell script, for example, into compiled code, 
Um, and then the runtime needs to execute that, and that needs to be, you know, uh, translated into CPU instructions at some time, at some point, and we need to get the output out again. So anything that kind of happens at the CPU level, uh, modern CPUs are really good at certain types of encryption, for example. So if you offload an encryption routine to your CPU, it's going to go super fast because the overhead is low from translating between these layers. Again, as you kind of move up the hardware stack, things are going to get slower. So if you interact with the native APIs in Windows, you're going to see that certain operations are pretty fast compared to if you go a level up and try to implement something in C-sharp or VB.net that's compiled against, uh, against .NET, right? Once again, talking about PowerShell, we have to go up like a translation layer again, and things get a little slow when you start using PowerShell operators versus operators in C-sharp, for example, that can be comp compiled. Um, and you have something like a C-sharp commandlet. It may, be, it may be written in C-sharp, but there are some well-defined functions that need to be invoked by the PowerShell runtime, right? Which, again, sits on top of the, of the .NET CLR. And then finally, if you implement your, uh, your, your functions using the PowerShell language, which is super convenient and easy for at least most people here to read, again, you kind of have this translation that incurs a lot of overhead and makes your code, code slower ultimately, right? Yep. Okay, so knowing all that, uh, going through your own code, uh, how do you go about identifying uh, the bottlenecks in your code? Uh, and there's there's really no no magic into this. Uh, the thing you have to do is you have to test, you have to measure, uh, and then see for yourself what is slowing things down. Uh, of course, probably all use the, the measure command, uh, useful for uh, for measuring the whole or certain parts of the script. Uh, there's also uh, some third-party profiling tools and even PowerShell scripts that let you uh, just point to a file or a script block, it will give you line by line with how much execution time each line took. So these are tools that you should use for for uh, trying to identify bottlenecks in your code. And uh, but perhaps even more importantly, uh, it's knowledge. To actually know about common pitfalls, to know about uh, the typical mistake that can be done, uh, and to know about uh, you know, how, how the language works. And, uh, and, and different ways of doing things. So uh, we're going to go through some, some typical scenarios now to, to help you with that last part of uh, knowing typical pitfalls. Uh, there is tons more uh, than we are going to present here. Uh, we just have four or five minutes, so we just had to pick some. Uh, we're going to talk uh, a little bit about immutable types. Um, and how we assign data to them uh, kind of overlaps with some of the things that Tobias uh, mentioned earlier today. Uh, we're going to talk about types and about knowing the type system. Uh, then we're going to talk a little bit about algorithms. Um, we can't have a PowerShell talk without talking about the pipeline, of course. Uh, we have something to say also about uh, recycling code and recycling data in your own code. And, uh, and the last point there is uh, about recursive functions. Um, if we get the time, I can I can show you some code, but it's it's basically just to be aware about how recursive functions works. Uh, they are functions that call themselves, uh, so that means that you have to uh, be careful if you if you write a, a recursive function. Uh, sometimes you have to, and sometimes they can be be good for performance as well, but uh, sometimes. They can take a heavy toll on the CPU. So, uh, immutable types. This uh, ties in with uh, you saw the example that uh, Tobias had earlier today. Uh, usually, you have a generic uh, array and you use plus equal to assign some kind of value to it. Uh, and it's the same thing with the string. If you have a string array or uh, or just a string that you want to add text to. I use the plus equal operator to, to assign a new value to it. Uh, and and that, that's well and good uh, if you're small scale testing or doing you know, something that you don't really care about performance or, uh, or anything like that. But it's important to know about immutable types. So immutable types means that uh, every time you assign a value to it, uh, it will have to create a new object in memory and then copy the data over and add the new data together with it every time you assign something to it. 
just a molt on system of string class. It's it's immutable, but it's still possible to, to mute it. So the string is kind of a special case. Uh, but, but for these examples, uh, it holds that you shouldn't really have it inside a tight loop, uh, iterating a million times over and assigning something uh, using a string. Then you have other classes that you should know about that are much better. Uh, the typical examples are, of course, to use a string builder instead of a string. If you need to, uh, to work with strings. Or an array list if you have to work with arrays. Uh, there, there are other ways of doing this, of course, also. There are, can be much faster, again, than, than using these. I think that's our first demo, actually. Okay. So, what I'm going to show you now is, perhaps I can show you the code first. How's the size? Is it okay? Do you, you see? So, this is a simple, simple uh, test. We are defining an array size of 10,000. Uh, and then we are going to assign those numbers to an array. And the first example you see that we use plus equal to assign the number. Uh, in the second example we are utilizing uh, some information that we already know before. And that is that since we already know the size of the array, uh, we can do something quite clever. And that is that we can define up front an array uh, with that size. And we don't only know the size of the array, we even know the type of the value we are going to insert. That means that we can be very specific. And you can see that we are creating a new object in 32 array uh, with a specific size. Uh, and we predict that this is going to be much faster. Anyone there to agree? Or disagree? <laughs> yeah, or this one. Um, There you go. See for yourself. Three seconds, uh, 3.3 seconds uh, versus 78 milliseconds. That's 10,000 integers uh, assigned to an array. Maybe just to show that we're not cheating here, just plug it again. Yeah, it might be. Uh, let's put some other numbers. Yep. Again, a significant difference between uh, using the additional order and Again, as, as Olikata hinted at, what's really happen happening under the hood is that since the uh, the array that's originally allocated cannot be resized, it's a fixed size kind of object, right? And it's mutable. What happens the second that you try to assign, you know, um, the size plus one to it, is that it reallocates a whole new array, and it's going to do this a number of times when we iterate over you know, uh, ten thousand times. Yeah. So. Uh, so Yeah, you go. Did you have a demo of that, yeah, or is yeah. that the one? Yeah. yeah. So, as I just mentioned, um, this is all very nice. Uh, you know, allocating a fixed size array. If you know the size of the data up front, if you know that you have um, a file with ten thousand lines that you need to you know, put into an array and operate uh, uh, process that data in there, then this is fine because you you know you know the size up front. You can allocate the memory for it, and, and you get this performance gain, right? But what if you don't know? What if you're fetching data from an external source and you need to filter it along the way and therefore cannot predict what is the size of the collection that you need to store this data? Uh, I mentioned uh, something that's, uh, and I think Tobias mentioned this this morning as well, the array list type. So this is a list type um, and that means that it can, it can resize dynamically. So you can add any number of objects to it. Uh, the nice thing about the array list is that it's compatible with .NET 2.0, so you can also use this in PowerShell v2. Um, it's not a specific thing. Uh, yeah, so this what you can see here is uh, 
this is a little bit like the old example, but here we're using for each loop. We're not making any. We're not making any assumptions about the size of the input data, right? Uh, and again, up here we have allocating an array up front, and then using the addition operator to add to it. This is probably going to be as slow as we just saw that it was. Uh, in the second example down here, we create an array list and. Uh, unlike the other example where we have to specify the size of the array, as you can see here, we just kind of create this object and don't make any assumptions about how big it needs to be, right? And then finally, we use this um, the add method here to uh, to append to the to the list. Right? So if we run this. We're again going to see that adding 10,000 uh, numbers to this uh, to the array at first using the addition operator takes all, almost three seconds. Adding to the array list is down to 23 milliseconds. Now you might say, isn't this even faster than what we just saw? The thing is, with these long numbers, only you know 10,000 iterations, and it might sound like a lot. But think about it, if you're doing this processing a million rows of data or a billion rows of data, right? Um, then we would probably see an, an even bigger difference. But again, you see the same significant difference between uh, using a non-fixed size array uh, and then the, uh, the array list here. Now, I was actually hoping to show, um, I even talked about, uh, instead of using just measure command, which is really nice for, you have a block of code, you want to see exactly how much time it took to execute. It would be really nice if we could get like a breakdown, like per line, how much time did it take to execute each statement here, right? If we could do that, um, we might be able to pinpoint exactly, ah, it's actually the addition operator, right? Otherwise, it's just kind of like, what are we doing wrong here? Um, so in the Windows 8 SDK, uh, there was a code sample written in C Sharp called uh, Measure Script, which is basically uh, an AST visitor. Uh, is anyone here like familiar with the concept of the AST? So, as Tobias mentioned earlier today, a kind of a fundamental block in PowerShell is the script block, this kind of block of code that you can execute, right? And the script block exposes something called uh, the AST, or an abstract syntax tree, that we can use to kind of reflect against the script block itself. So we can get the script block to tell us about itself. So I can say, how many if statements does this script block have, and the script block itself can actually tell me. And so the approach um, with, this, uh, with this module that was included in the SDK was basically you take the entire AAC, you go through line by line, and then you inject a method call at the start and the end of each line that measures this is the start time, this is the end time, and then at the end of this, you're, you're going to end up with an actual measurement of how much time it took to execute every, all iterations of this, uh, of this script. Let's see this So um, what I did in order to kind of show this was I took this measure script uh, SDK sample and I rewrote it in PowerShell because in PowerShell v5 we now have the, uh, the possibility to implement classes, right? Just like you might know them from vb.net or, uh, or C sharp or, or another managed .net language. Uh, so I put this PowerShell, put it into a new module called, me called measure script. And so what we should be able to see here is that Together. But what you can see here, rather than getting a single count of like how much time did this take, we now get on the left side here, on the time taken column, you can actually see exactly which line took up how much time of the entire execution time. So here it becomes obvious, you know, you can see that the entire script is slow, but here it kind of becomes obvious that the big big kind of center here is the addition operator. As you can see, everything is like a few milliseconds, even down here. But up here, it takes three seconds, almost the entire execution time of this uh, So this is kind of useful if you want to dive a little deeper into you know, what is actually going on in here. Um, the only thing that bothers me about MeasureScript is that 
this height, if you have, you can see here we did uh, 10,000 iterations, like this line executed 10,000 times, right? But what is hidden for me here is which iteration was, was fast, which one was slow, did it take longer time the first time I executed this line of code versus the last time I executed this line of code? So I augmented uh, measure script a little bit. And instead of measuring every time a line is run and just adding the total result, uh, I actually had it tell me exactly the execution time of each line. And what I want to show you here is kind of a, a graph showing that this gets slower over time. Now, when we started going through our demos, Obviously, something has to go wrong. So when we tested our demos 10 minutes ago and I tried to output this, uh, I, I got a blank chart, so I won't actually be able to show you this. Um, I'll, gladly, I'll gladly publish um, a fixed version once we get it fixed. But um, what we do here. And know that it was very well. <laughs> yep. We'll, we'll try to get it fixed uh, before we publish it. Yeah. To, uh, to the result, so. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the next part is uh, is about algorithms. Uh, I guess you're going to talk about that right. as well. So uh, this word algorithm, uh, I think. I, I had to like this when I st started doing IT operations. Uh, I think, did anyone see Flynn's uh, session before about Docker? He mentioned this fact that for, for a lot of time he had been, or for a long time he's been interested in the hardware that his applications run on, the infrastructure that supports it, the network bandwidth. And only recently he kind of started to getting into like, what are the applications actually doing? How are they implemented? How do they work? And how does it kind of match onto the stack that he'd been carrying uh, uh, for for a long time? And this word algorithm, to me, meant either a naughty math, math professor somewhere talking about you know the mathematical concepts of computer science or a computer science major. And this was very intimidating to me. But in all simplicity, an algorithm is really just a description, a recipe for how you want to do something, right? How can we describe how we want to process a set of data or do some sort of calculation to get, it, to, get to a certain result? Uh, and I think it's worth pointing out that a lot of the problems that we solve with computers today, uh, no matter whether we call it the cloud or you do it on your own computer, it's the same kinds of problems that we're solving over and over again. A lot of these problems have has been solved either in the last 30 years or in the last 400 years. Um, and so I talk to a lot of people who say, I have this piece of code, it's functionally working, but it's super slow. What, what can I do to fix this? And what they've forgotten to kind of ask themselves is, how do I solve this problem? They just kind of bang away at the problem until they find a solution without thinking a little structured about how do we solve this problem. Um, one of the examples that came up recently was, um, is everyone familiar with um, the Fibonacci sequence? So one plus one equals two, you take the last two numbers, add them together, and you get a set of numbers that are relative to uh, what's called phi or the, or the golden ratio. Um, someone asked me recently, how can I calculate you know, the nth number in the Fibonacci sequence? And the, the answer is obvious. You just go through the sequence and calculate it one by one, and when you get to number n, you just take that and you know what that is. He said, yeah, that doesn't, like, that doesn't seem very nice. That doesn't seem very elegant. Is there a better way to do this? So I thought, mm, well, maybe let's, let's try to Google this. So I Googled calculate and Fibonacci number. And one of the first things that came up was a, an algorithm for doing exactly this. This algorithm is 400 or 200, uh, 200 years old, I think. It's called um, uh, Binet's formula. The idea is that, this is kind of badly expressed, but the idea is that you can express this as, as a mathematical formula and without doing a recursive function that has to run, you know, 60 times to get the 60th uh, number in the Fibonacci sequence, you can do two simple calculations and you can get back the exact number that you need. So, we do something like this. Uh, 
one day and three motion sequence. It just has to do these two things of calculation and it returns immediately rather than to having to wait for, you know, 40 ripples, of course. Um, this obviously doesn't solve any real world problem for you guys, you know, trying to measure uh, uh, IT infrastructure, you know, at home. Uh, but the idea was kind of to show that if you take a step back and look at the problem you're trying to solve and then try to Google it, for example, chances are that someone has already solved this a hundred times over before. And reusing, you know, not reinventing the wheel is also a way to save a lot of seconds. Uh, one of my favorite kind of algorithms when I kind of got into this, oh, you know, yeah, I can reuse all of this knowledge, uh, was the, uh, the fisher Yates shuffle. Um, so, let's say you're in a situation where you have a, a big array of, of objects or numbers or whatever, and you need to shuffle them, so you need them in a random order, right? In a randomized order of this otherwise sorted data. Uh, one, one kind of common approach I've seen, because it's super easy and kind of uh, intuitive if you know the pipeline, is just to take your array, uh, pipe it to sort object, and then call get random every time sort object tries to order these items, right? So you end up with a, uh, with a randomized order. But this takes a long time if, uh, if, your, uh, if your data set gets big, and if you, if you open, uh, let's say, um, the task manager on your machine, you'll also observe that the PowerShell process at some point is going to consume a lot of memory, trying to keep all of, like they're trying to keep a list of all of these numbers that it's trying to randomize, uh, and at some point you're gonna get uh, like an OM uh, exception or something like that. So what I've done here is I've, take, I've taken basically the, the pseudo code for, for the uh, Fisher Yates article on, uh, on Wikipedia, expressed it in PowerShell. It's basically a for loop with these, uh, with these two operations. Uh, one thing that's super nice in PowerShell that I don't see a lot of people using is the multi-value assignment operator. That is, you can take two variables on the, on the left-hand side and then uh, two value expressions on the right-hand side, and you can then do multiple assignments at once. This works really well if you want to swap two values, which is basically what this job does. This also means that you don't need to spin up a temporary variable and, and uh, waste the memory right there. But if we try to run this, for 100,000, 10,000, 100,000 items, so at first, there's not really a noticeable difference, right? Yeah, 20, 20 milliseconds, 50 milliseconds. Over a thousand items, yeah, it's kind of the same, less than, less than 100 milliseconds. When we're testing with 10,000 items, we're actually starting to see that using this Fisher Yates uh, in place shuffle takes only half a second, where using sort objects. Uh, it's almost, uh, it takes almost twice as, as much time. And the last one... We're gonna have to wait a while. Um, <laughs> so other than ha having just uh, saved a lot of RAM on your box, again, very useful if you want to do this uh, across the large data, uh, data sets, um, we've also uh, cut the execution time by around 40%. Yep. Then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the pipeline. Uh, again, a topic that was covered by uh, by Tobias this morning. So uh, could be a little bit of overlap there. Um, so the pipeline is uh, kind of the the best thing and the worst thing <laughs> PowerShell will have. Um, it's brilliant if you use it correctly, but it can uh, be deadly if you use it wrong. So basically speaking, if you if you use the pipeline, you would uh, use more CPU, but you would save on memory, and the other way around if you don't use it. And I think Tobias had some examples for that. So uh, streaming as opposed to downloading and then watching. Um, and uh, there's one thing that uh, that we want to say about the pipeline, uh, kind of a general tips. Uh, to opt out early, meaning that if you, if you have a, large collection that you want to stream to, uh, try to, to get out of the stream as, as soon as possible when you have whatever information you need from the stream instead of going through the whole thing. A uh, typical example of that is, uh, for instance, using select object, first one, as from there. 
if the only thing you are after is the first item in the collection. Uh, that means that you don't have to iterate through the whole collection uh, at all. Uh, and the same thing applies if you are creating a function that supports pipelining. Uh, don't introduce any any complex and large running stuff in in the pipeline, because then that will be the, the slowest link, which will mean that the whole pipeline will slow down. I think we have some demos on that as well. So yeah, this first example that you see there is actually one thing that I did in a function uh, and I was uh, told by, uh, by someone else that uh, it was kind of unfair on, uh, on get random since I was using the pipeline with such large numbers. Um, and it's kind of obvious when pointed out, but it's so easy to just do it like this. You just quickly create uh, a list of numbers and you pipe it into get random to, to just randomly pick one of them. Easy, right? Uh, but what you have to keep in mind is that uh, all of these numbers are actually going through the pipeline before get random has a chance to actually randomly pick one of them. So in this case, it's what is it, 100,000 numbers? going through the pipeline and then get random picks one of them. So in this case it's much faster to just use the min max parameters of the command button instead. Uh, and that's something that I see often is that uh, in, in the places where it's not always so smart to use the pipeline it's because that you have parameters uh, on the commandlet that are faster. A very good example of that is uh, get child item. Uh, if you look at example 3 here to see what I'm doing here is you know doing a recursive search piping it to where object to find all text files something most of we have probably done several times right um, but the get shell item has a filter parameter uh, which means that it will do the filtering uh, on the file provider itself before returning the, the results back to you and it's magnitude uh, faster than, uh, than using the pipeline. So that's also an example of good versus bad. Uh, the same example too there. Pretty much where object. Every time you use where object for filtering you should stop and think uh, and uh, pull up the help of the commandlet before the pipe and just see if there's an, uh, a way of filtering uh, closer, uh, so that you don't have to, to to use where object in the pipeline at all. So for get process, for instance, you can use the name parameter, which supports wildcards for filtering. Uh, and if you see in the last two examples here are examples of, of opting out early. So uh, this is also quite common, if you see example 4 here, you have an array, and you just wrap it in parentheses and uh, do a Square bracket zero, you know that gives you the, the first first item in the array. Um, but in in this case, the, the numbers are large, uh, and in the other case, we are reading from a quite large file. It takes time. So uh, and, and this one is actually quite interesting. In my control. So this is I'm just getting the file first, and we have. Fifteen milliseconds. Uh, let's try that. So here we're using that tip of opting out early. We're using select first one, and there you go. Much faster. It doesn't have to iterate through the whole contents of the file before giving you back that first object that you want to. So, when we talk about going green uh, and recycling your data, or recycling your object, or recycling your code, for that matter, um, what we're really talking about is, um, I see sometimes people use, let's say you have a huge CSV file and you need some data from it. 
let's say you need the, the company name of a number of companies in a CSV file. So I see people do import CSV, their CSV file. Then they pipe it to select object or for each and get just the name property because that's the very first thing they need to output or that they need to process. Now 10 lines later, they're going to do the same thing again. Import CSV, same CSV file, select company ID. And then 10 lines later again, they're going to do the same thing one more time. And usually when people, when I see this, it's because people ask me, how do I now correlate these three values? Well, you don't need to split them in the first place. If you need a full data set and you know you're going to need all of the data, store it in a variable or maybe put it into a hash table uh, for, um, for faster lookup um, and then reuse that within your script. Um, other examples of, uh, of this kind of uh, non-reusal is um, reading input from users and writing it to text files and then reading it back, back from text files. It might seem convenient at the time, but definitely not what you want to do. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, techniques for, uh, for doing optimizations. Um, as with everything, it's not the most uh, fun thing to do, but it all starts with good code design. Um, so, uh, so if you take time up front to, to plan out what you're trying to achieve, uh, it will be easier uh, to do optimization techniques later. Uh, one invaluable tool uh, is using pseudocode, um, both as an optimization technique but also as a code design technique. I'm going to show you some, some examples of that. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so, so this is actually from, uh, uh, from an entry on Stack Overflow. Some uh, someone asked had, had written a script to count keywords found in Word documents. So they had a, a directory of a lot of Word documents, and they had a text file with keywords. And they needed to figure out how many documents had keyword one and how many had the next keyword, and so on. And written the code that they had written were. I've simplified it a little bit, but this is pretty much uh, the code. And the question that they were asking were pretty much uh, why is it so slow? <laughs> is it any, any way of, of optimizing this? And, and this is where pseudocode can help you, because just looking at the code, it's not obvious right away what the problem is. It's functionally working. I can run the script and count the functions in in, in the files. Um, so if you, if you take the time to write down the core functionality uh, of this function as pseudocode, it will look something like this. Uh, so we have for each keyword, we are creating a Word application, reading all the Word documents, and then again looping through all the documents. We are opening them and looking for keywords. Now it's kind of obvious where the bottleneck is, isn't it? For every keyword inside the loop, he's creating a new word application. And in the same loop, he's reading all the word documents over and over again for every iteration. So this last point uh, comes directly back to, to reusing uh, data instead of reading them one by one. So knowing this by using pseudocode, we can rewrite the pseudocode to form our solution. And that is just to move those two steps outside of the loop. And again, this is a brilliant tool uh, because it's much easier now to just use the pseudocode to convert the code uh, back and you will get the solution. The nice thing about this is that, as Ivan says, you can do this on a piece of paper or you can do it in Notepad or wherever you want. You don't have actually have to touch the code. So in this example, where you have, you know, working code, and you're afraid you're going to jump into a rabbit hole trying to kind of fix this ad hoc, take a step back, look at it, yeah. throw it down on a piece of paper. So I'm going to just show you the the first script that had the issue. Let me run it. So it's it's running. There you go. I. This is just three word documents and, and uh, three keywords. 
Uh, but it took took seven seconds, so you can imagine how much time it would take if you have a library of a couple thousand word documents or something like that. And then we have the revised one that we now can easily create based on the, the pseudocode where we fixed it. So here we have just moved those two lines outside the loop. There you go. We have an optimized solution. But there's actually a, pos a possibility of optimizing this even further. Uh, I just did put a problem in it since I just have to. <laughs> um, because I didn't really like that it was looping through all the keywords first and then have a second loop lo looping through all the, all the documents. So I just swapped it around. So I started with all the documents. Uh, and then I used the keywords uh, in a second loop inside that as well. That meant that I have to count in a different way, so I had to use a hash table to keep track of uh, stuff. But let's see how it performs. There we go, even faster. So it sometimes makes sense to just use a little bit of time uh, looking at the problem uh, and do testing. Uh, one of the things that I also wrote on this slide here. Uh, test small chunks of code. Uh, if you have a large complex script, it's better to just isolate small chunks. Take the first part that you have probably used a profiler or something to identify that this is one of the parts that are uh, taking a long time. Do test, small test, uh, and then scale up and then you can do another code. and. After you have optimized small codes, you can you can combine them into big gear and then run new prof profiling or new optimization techniques on them, and just go go bigger. Does anyone use this technique trying to kind of express your code as as, uh, as natural language and, and work with it that way? Did you? Yeah. Okay, so we can obviously take this further, right? This was um, this was kind of some of the common pitfalls um, uh, and some, some some general advice, I would say. Uh, but obviously, you're also going to come to a point uh, where maybe you, I think one of the first points we raised was that one of the four items we're usually waiting on is network latency, right? And that means that your computer is not really doing anything, right? It's waiting for an external resource and it's just Wasted time, right? And uh, what what people usually su suggest in this in this kind of um, in this kind of situation is is using concurrent programming, right? Multi-threading your workload. So if you have, let's say, you need to connect to a thousand machines to check their status or connect to them or copy a uh, file from disk or something like that, instead of instead of connecting to a thousand machines in sequence and potentially having to wait, you know, ten seconds for a network timeout every time. Then what you want to do is you want to do this in parallel, right? All of this you don't need to do this in order, right? Uh, one of the most like um, common attempts at doing multi-threading in PowerShell because the syntax is very intuitive is using jobs, right? So you use uh, start job, but there's a huge overhead in using jobs for parallelization. In that when you start a new job, what happens in the background is the PowerShell actually spins up uh, and um, a new process in the background needs to serialize all of your input, run that in the background, and then you collect the results. So even though you might be able to parallelize some tasks using start job, for example, you end up incurring a lot of overhead in you know dispatching the job and kind of collecting, collecting and, and deserializing all the data again. So one of the more interesting approaches to this uh, is built into the PowerShell API itself. Uh, is anyone here familiar with the concept of run spaces? Yeah, very nice. So a run space is basically like uh, the shell in which your, your PowerShell runs, right? Um, it's, it's the execution engine that runs your code. Um, and in the API, uh, there's, a, there's a class called uh, run space pool. The idea is that you set up a pool, a little, little bit like a thread pool. You set up a pool of these, and then you can just ask it, please execute these thousand, thousand pieces of code, connect to these thousand machines. Then you just wait for the for the run spaces inside this run space pool to finish, and then you collect the results again. Um, 
we could do uh, we could do a demo on how to set this up yourself. But oh, as we talked about fine. before, oh yeah, okay, we don't <laughs> have time for that. Um, as we talked about before, reuse code, don't reinvent the wheel. Uh, there's a couple of really cool projects implementing run spaces uh, and using the run space pool out there. Search for something like Hush Irish Jobs by Bo Crux, I think. Yeah. Uh, invoke Parallel um, by Peel's Cookie Monster, uh, and there's a, a bunch of other implementations implementing slightly different syntax. I think. And Chris Lemaire's website, yeah, yeah, yeah. Plenty of resources. Um, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about uh, using managed code. Yeah, it's uh, it's an obvious uh, way if you really important uh, about uh, if you really want to squeeze out the last uh, milliseconds of the code. But it's it's a lot of work. I had a session last year about where I used Win32 API. Uh, it means that you have to dive into uh, C sharp and, uh, and the the managed code API. Uh, so it's uh, if you want to go down that rabbit hole, uh, just make sure that it's worth your time because uh, you're going to. To struggle a little bit with it, but uh, in the end, it's almost certainly going to be worth it. Um, yeah, the, the same goes if uh, if uh, if you just want to use C sharp code in, in a PowerShell script. That also sometimes gives you a, a nice benefit yeah. if there's something you can't do with the net directly. As as we mentioned before, PowerShell 5.0 supports classes a little bit like the uh, the class implementation in C sharp. It doesn't have all the features, but it actually has some of the performance benefits because the second the script is loaded with the class definition in it, PowerShell is going to try try and kind of pre-compile this code, so you get almost the same performance benefit from trying to uh, um, compile managed code, so compiling a C sharp native, for example. So there's also a performance gain to be had there simply because of how classes are implemented. Yeah. So just to, to summarize, though, uh, we're all slaves to physics, uh, and know your type system. Uh, no, no more uh, plus equal assignment, please. Think before you type. Don't reinvent the wheel. Um, at least test. That's uh, that's important. Uh, yeah, you've probably seen this slide a couple of times by now. Any questions? So crystal clear. All right. If you have any questions, you can just uh, come up and talk to us after. Okay.